Uh, Chef Stan, thank you so much for being with us here today. Uh, I'm Conrad, I'm with Power Science, uh, here with David, our culinary talent, uh, some of you may know already. And uh, this is our second session today, so we, we're trying to be scrambling before the show. Um, again, thanks for being here, it's always a pleasure to be a, a part of the ACF. And uh, for, the, for the years, uh, past years, we, we were coming out with um, a lot of training on sous vide. Uh, um, as we see, you know, most of the uh, ACF chefs know, knows exactly how to cook sous vide. Uh, so we don't have to teach you the basics. But we're going into like more serious topics right now, which is the hasa, which I'm sure everyone loves in this room. Uh, so Dave was working on it for the last uh, about two weeks. <laughs> Um, please note that um, whatever we're going to show you here is based on our research and development, deep, deep research and development. Um, you may quote us, um, but if you think... But if uh, something goes wrong, yeah. now you can quote <laughs> us. You didn't hear this from us, no, it shouldn't be like that. But um, um, it's, it's very interesting uh, how, this con how the whole um, thing around uh, HACCP is misunderstood. We, as polyscience, uh, are receiving calls from chefs uh, where some, uh, where cer certain um, health inspectors are sending them to us. Uh, sending them to me, to, to my day. personal all day, cell phone. All day from polyscience, he's going to tell you about the HASA plan for civic cooking. And this is really troublesome because we don't have this authority. So we're always asking you to consult your local health inspector, but Dave has uh, those basics uh, lined up for you guys, and I hope you're gonna enjoy it, and it will be informative. Thank you so much. Awesome. Uh, yep, you're on, you're on keyboard duty. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about acid basics of ROP and sous vide. So before we start, let's get one thing out of the way. Go ahead. There is no one size fits all HACCP plan. That guy, they'll cope. It doesn't work. Uh, so if you try to apply, um, uh, let's say a plug and play has a plan, it doesn't necessarily work for your, for your environment. Uh, there's gonna be things that you have to change um, and so on. So uh, today we're gonna talk about what you need in a has a plan. And the problem is, is that can change. Depending on what your inspector wants to go above or beyond or below or whatever they, they want, they can go beyond the basics because they want to keep you know, people safe. Um, the health department is great, um, but sometimes um, there's fear on either side and that doesn't make either, either party um, comfortable. So they just say, no, 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 no. So hopefully we can alleviate some of those concerns. So what is HACCP? HACCP is, is an acronym for Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points. It is a food, system, food safety system that combines elements of microbiology, quality control, and risk assessment in order to decrease the risk of foodborne illness. They want to say, hey, do you have a plan in place if the dookie hits the fan and people are going to be okay and we can trace back to where things went wrong? That's basically what it is. Right. So why do you need HACCP? Well, different combinations of heat treatments, uh, salt concentration, sugar, pH, and intrinsic antimicrobial and antibotulinal properties of foods and the cold chain uh, in your particular environment all affect the foods differently. So what does this mean? It means that you can potentially um, create unsafe conditions based on product. And that creates room for concern. So, <clears throat> and I haven't had my coffee yet, but Concerns associated with sous processing involve the microbiological safety of products, the psychotropic foodborne pathogens, particularly macrobolytic group 2, Clostridium botulinum bacteria, concern due to the blah, 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 blah. Basically, what this says is that actually sous vide creates a very good environment for uh, harmful nasties to grow. Um, However, the temperature control and chill change is often inadequate and temperature boost is common throughout the distribution and retail markets by consumers. That last part of this whole thing is really important. The cold chain, we'll talk about temperatures uh, later on, but the cold chain is really where things get like, 
you have to have, for good reason, you have to have your, your stuff in place and you have to have your um, refrigeration uh, monitored and under good control and stuff like that. Like, hey, walk-ins running uh, a little warm today, guys, try not to go in and out of it so much. Like, that's not okay um, in this case, because uh, that can create very, very real concern for uh, food safety. So uh, basically, the, go back for a second. National Center for Biotechnology Information. Go forward one. So they did a challenge study in that big paragraph that we just glazed over. They did a challenge study um, and where, these, where the risks of sous vide were um, examined. Uh, if you go to that link, you'll see it um, and the results of their challenge study. But basically, what did they say? The results of the present study indicate that the safety of sous vide products with respect to non-proteolytic C. botulinum has to be carefully evaluated product, product by product. An increase in processing time and temperature with semiological solution, however, the difference in the p-values of these high-risk products, blah, blah, however, the degree of benefit gained from thermal processing, blah, blah, greatly different from, blah, blah, uh, eventually, uh, Additionally, adverse effects on sensory and nutritional qualities by increased thermal <coughs> treatment are the opposite of the original idea of sous vide processing. So what they're looking at this and saying, well, like, why don't you just cook the hell out of it? Well, that's kind of what we're trying not to do by cooking sous vide and by doing that, we could potentially, potentially, create an unsafe condition. Um, C botulinum, non proteolytic C botulinum being the main concern. Let's move forward. Botulism! Yeah. Uh, botulism. Okay, let's go to the next one. I'm not going to dig too deep into this because we can go down like a rabbit hole we'll never get out of it. We'll never go to the show floor and we're not going to go to Disney tonight. It's going to be terrible. We'll just be here talking about bacteria. It's not today. We're going to do a top layer and then maybe next year I'll do a, a 102 class. We'll see how it goes. So, proteolytic and non-proteolytic. There's two types uh, of Australian botulinum, non-proteolytic and proteolytic. Proteolytic cannot grow at temperatures below 12C. Therefore, you got good refrigeration. So I'm going to keep referencing Celsius um, in, in this talk today. Five, your refrigerator, your walk-in is five. Uh, so it cannot grow below temperatures of 12C. Therefore, not really a concern. Non-proteolytic strains can grow as low as 3C. What did I just say your refrigerator was? You see the concern. Uh, albeit slowly, and it depends on many other inhibitory factors such as salt, pH, uh, sugar, water activity, and other things that like you have marinades in there that contain um, uh, yogurt that has good bacteria, stuff like that. Like, um, there's, many, there's many kids in the pool that are all playing together, um, and that's why back to two slides ago, before botulism, uh, we said that the, the concern has to be assessed on an individual product by product level because salt, pH, sugar, water activity, and so on, um, all affect things differently. So how do you detect botulism? Proteolytic strains produce odors, gas, and et cetera, and are therefore detectable. If you see bloated bags, throw them out. That could be uh, proteolytic uh, botulism. Could be other things too. See bloated bags, throw them out. One of our competitors in their literature says, oh, if something smells a little funny or whatever, you deep fry it. <laughs> what? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and actually, uh, there was somebody. Uh, Philip had a, had a moment where he was uh, he was going he was trolling some forums, <laughs> and uh, somebody was prepping their Easter dinner, and they were cooking their ham sous vide or whatever it was, or it was a lamb leg or something, and the bag was like floating and whatever, and he's like trying to create an account and log in and like write a comment or whatever. He's like, do not serve that. So proteolytic, you can detect. It's sticky, there's smell, there's things that go with it that you can say, oh, I shouldn't eat that. Uh, however, non-proteolytic, and remember, non-proteolytic, under 3C, he's, or above 3C, he's still active, which is not good. So non-proteolytic is largely undetectable. They do not produce uh, any signals. Danger, Will Robinson, danger, okay? Um, Talk about the spores. Clostridium botulinum bacteria produce spores that are inert. They will become active or regenerate after being heat damaged and can 
reproduce toxin again if conditions are right. Protein source, anaerobic environment, low acid, low salt, low sugar, ambient temperatures, <coughs> sous vide conditions. To kill the spore itself, it must undergo conditions of at least 250 Fahrenheit for at least three minutes. The, old, the only way to avoid germination of these spores is to maintain temperature of zero to three during shelf life. What does that mean? Okay, think of Wolverine, right? You can beat him all the way down until he's nearly dead. He's coming back, right? That's botulism. You can heat damage it, you can pummel it into submission, you ain't gonna kill it. It's coming back. And then it can, it can start producing spores again. Even if you killed the spores that it produced, it can make new spores. And those spores can produce BTX. BTX is a neurotoxic protein produced by cl Clostridium botulinum. About one microgram, a microgram, is lethal to humans when inhaled. BTX is destroyed by a heat treatment of 85C for longer than five minutes or 80C for longer than 10 minutes. That's good news, because we can do that in a sous vide bath. So who, was in, who attended probably like three years ago, my like sous vide like brain dump, my one hour brain dump where we talked about high, low, 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 and all that stuff? Okay, so remember we talked about dropping product in to pasteurize the surface of it? We have an approach that we call step-by-step um, -step, uh, that was figured out by Bruno Gusso and his team at Crea, where they're going to have two baths. And they have one running at anywhere between 83 and 85, depending on what they're cooking, and then their core temperature bath, and they'll start it in this uh, first bath, and then they move it to the other bath because that treatment treats BTX toxins, and those toxins are what get you. It's not the spores, it's not, uh, it's not the bacteria, it's the BTX. That's your, that's your major player. So if we can, if we can uh, kill, we can kill the toxin pretty easily. The spores there though, that same class we talked about pre-searing, anybody who talks to me about sous vide is gonna hear me get on my apple box and start talking about uh, pre-searing because pre-searing uh, sets the structure of product, um, it starts the Maillard reaction, so product is more flavorful, and it's good for killing harmful nasties on the surface and pasteurize the surface of that product. 250 for at least three minutes, we sear on the control freak at 400. So we're killing, or we're heat damaging spores. That's all I'm gonna say about that. Again, we can like be here all day. We'll make dinner together or something. Like we'll be here all night if we go further than this. Like that's the end of that. Next slide. So what can you do? The advisory and committee of microbiology, microbiological safety of food recommends these things uh, in chilled foods with a shelf life of more 10 days. Pause. Why do they say of more than 10 days? Because um, being at three, we said three is important, three is a golden number today. Um, the spores, after we've beat Wolverine in the submission, uh, it's going to take a long, not a long time, but a long enough time where he's going to start to regenerate, produce spores, and spores are going to produce toxin. So if you, got, if you do these things and you have a shelf life of less than 10 days on your product, you're probably in a good spot. Um, otherwise, a heat treatment of 90C for 10 minutes or equivalent of lethality is what they recommend for their uh, toxin treatment. Um, I forget where I found the 85 for five minutes stuffed in the back of this presentation. Uh, pH of five or less, minimum salt level of three and a half percent, water activity of 0.97 or less, or a combination of heat treatment and preservative factors which, can be, which have been shown on paper to reduce uh, growth and toxin production by C. botulinum. So they say you gotta do two of these things in, in conjunction with um, a good cold chain. That's as far as we're going to go on that. That's if you're going to start beyond 10 days. Yes. And this is Advisory Committee of Microbiological Safety of Food, and I believe they're somewhere out of New Zealand or something to that realm. So this isn't within the U.S. But the, that doesn't change. That's another thing is like your regulatory body can say like, well, that's not our document or whatever. That doesn't change the science of what's happening. It just means that it hasn't slid across their desk yet. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. Because <laughs> I'm gonna get in trouble. Uh, but there's good news. 
So, uh, in a document that I found from the Food, uh, Food Authority of New South Wales and Australia, as far as can be determined from any scientific literature and foodborne illness databases, sous vide chefs have been, man been successful in managing food safety and food poisoning attributed to sous vide has not been identified. There is not one recorded case uh, with sous vide directly linked to foodborne illness. In Australia? No, in any database across the globe. That's all I'm going to say about that. That was a lot to take in. Let's just take a moment. I got the relaxed puppy. I thought he was cute. Okay. So, uh, before we talk about uh, the seven HACCP principles, uh, the in ins and outs of a HACCP plan, we need to speak the same language. Okay. So, a hazard is defined as a biological, physical, or chemical property that may cause a food to be unsafe for consumption. Norovirus, poor quality packaging. So let's see an example of a biological hazard is norovirus. Later we're going to talk about the HACCP worksheet, hazard analysis worksheet. Potential hazard that goes in the biological column, norovirus. <laughs> right? Um, that's always present. Um, but then there's um, physical hazards. Uh, when I received my beef today, uh, there was milk leaking on it because it came from the same truck and a milk gallon leaked and that's a potential uh, biological and potential uh, physical or potential physical that is a physical and a potential biological hazard. Uh, critical control point. This is an operational step in your process where you can apply control and either prevent or reduce the hazard to an acceptable level. I'm going to do this thing at this step, which ensures that my risk is very low, if not gone. Critical limit are these prescribed parameters that are in place to ensure that a CCP, a critical control point, effectively controls a hazard. And this is something that's measured. I know this is confusing. You'll see relaxed puppy again. Um, an operational step is an activity in the flow of food. Receiving, packaging, cooking, cooling, these are steps. And there's usually like, I don't want to say that there's usually like, I want to say that you can put these in a chart. It comes to my door, I check it in, it goes into a cooler, it goes from the cooler to the prep station, it gets prepped, it goes back into the cooler. These are like steps that happen. Uh, and corrective action. This is something that needs to take place when results of monitoring show that a control has been lost at a CCP. So an example of a corrective action, if my food falls below 135, the food will be reheated to 165 for 15 seconds, and I will record this corrective action. Let's go to the next one. Monitoring. So we just said monitoring uh, is this step where we're measuring our critical limits to make sure that we're hitting them. Uh, the sous chef will check product temperature to ensure that the appropriate core temperature before packaging. This is just an example of one. Uh, my monitoring step for cooking chicken breasts. Line cook will probe chicken when it is done to ensure that the core is 165. That's monitoring. Verification activities is making sure that your car is running like a well-oiled machine. This is ensuring that monitoring and the HACCP plan are, everything is working. At the end of the night, I'm gonna have my glass of bourbon and go over my temperature logs and all my corrective action logs and everything and make sure that everything is happening as it should. And record keeping. I got my temp I've got my cooler logs, I've got my probe logs, I've got all my this, and I'm gonna keep those on the place when our clipboard and thermometer friends walk through the door and I say, here you go. I have all these for one year. There you go. Uh, process flow is the flow of food through your process starting with receiving and it goes through the food is served. And then we have our standard operating procedures. This is a written method of a controlled practice in accordance with specifications to obtain a desired outcome. What? Standard operating procedure. This is our hand washing procedure. This is our written procedure for how we sanitize our table. This is how we clean equipment. This is how we calibrate our probes. Uh, you're gonna need um, quite a few SOPs when you hand in your, um, when you hand in your HACCP plan because some 
hazards are not handled at critical control points by critical limits. What? So, uh, that's a chew, right? This can happen anywhere, and that's not handled by cooking, cooling, whatever. This is addressed with our employee hygiene standard operating procedure. If you wash your hands before you touch the product, if you sneeze, you wash your hands again, and stuff like that. So sometimes SOPs control, uh, apply control at CCPs. It's okay, we're, we're getting there. Next one? See, relax, puppy. Okay, let's move on. The seven principles of HACCP. We have hazard analysis, CCPs, critical limits, our monitoring, our corrective actions, our verification, and our record keeping. Let's move on. Okay, so these are the seven principles. So first we're gonna analyze hazards. We're gonna say, what hazards exist at an operational step? Some of them are addressed through SOPs. So at the beginning of your asset plan, you just have to keep that in mind that I need to have some standardized operating procedures in hand, or on hand to mitigate hazards. CCPs, working through our process flow, which we'll get to, uh, will identify operational steps where control can be applied. Again, these I try to look at as like steps in the process. I'm receiving product, it goes into cold holding, it goes into prep, it goes back into cold holding. It goes into vacuum packaging, it gets cooked and held, and then it gets served. That's my process flow. And at these points, I can establish critical limits. So my critical limit for my CCP cooking, my chicken has a critical limit of 165 for 15 seconds. In this case, if we're cooking sous vide, we're doing it lower or whatever, I'm gonna hold it at, my critical limit might be uh, 149 for two hours, whatever that is. And then those critical limits have to be monitored to make sure that we hit it. Line cook will take temperature of finished chicken with calibrated thermometer, ensure critical limit has been reached. So you see, it's kind of like a ladder. We see these are my hazards that exist throughout my process. Here's my process written out. At these steps, I've got critical limits, things that need to be hit to make sure we're safe and we can, we can pass go, we can collect 100 bucks, we can go to the next step. And then we've got monitoring to make sure that critical limit is happening. Uh, and then we have corrective actions. Let's say through monitoring our CCP, our cooking of our chicken breast, chicken's not at 165. So what's our corrective action? Keep cooking until it hits 165. Like some of this stuff, like it sounds complex, but really it's like the inverse of your critical limit. If you didn't do it, do it. If you can't do it for whatever reason, maybe the product needs to be discarded, something like that. Um, but corrective actions need to be logged. You need to have a corrective action log. Today, I threw out a case of chicken because um, they didn't hit their core target temperature in enough time or whatever it is. So corrective actions need to be logged. Um, and then verification activity. Manager will take bourbon into office and review temperature logs and procedures daily. So he's gonna sit there and go through all the logs and say, it looks like we're having a problem uh, at vacuum packaging. It says that we a bunch of bags leaked. And then I see, uh, I have the new PolyScience 400 series and I can see who vacuum sealed the bag. And I say, John, uh, all my vacuum bags leaked today. Why did the vacuum bags leak? I don't know. Go home, John. Uh, and then you look at them, you see that the seal is not consistent from edge to edge. Oh, my tape needs to be fixed. Corrective action, uh, this is what happened. We determined the cause to be um, a poor seal bar. We've replaced the seal bar, da da da. Here's my initials, I did it on this time at this date. Uh, we sealed the bags, everything seems to be working correctly now. That's corrective action log. Uh, and then record keeping. I keep all of those things on file so when our clipboard and thermometer people come through the door and they say, Where's your HACCP plan? You say, it's right here. It has to be easily accessible if you're like, oh, hang on a minute, it's in the basement, and it's like, I I'm not sure it's all there. That's a problem. Like, if you're gonna have a HACCP plan in place, you need to be on top of your game. Uh, we, were at a, we were recently in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and big chain, big, big chain. I won't name it, uh, but they were trying to implement uh, sous vide as part of their, they do a lot of wings, I'll say that. Uh, not a lot of wings. Uh, they do a lot of wings, 
and they were trying to implement sous vide because it cuts down on their ticket times and they get greater yield. They were able to cut their ticket times on their wings in half. Um, and in game day, that's important, yo. Uh, so they were trying to implement this and they would come to the door and they'd say, okay, let's see those logs. And the guy would go, well, he's not working today, so can you come back tomorrow, bro? No, they can't. Like, you need to be able to produce this on the spot. I can't stress how important it is when you have this in place that you stay up on it because all it takes is like, one slip and the health department is going to be on you like white on rice. So has the plants come in a variety of colors but the ingredients are all the same. I can show you guys two different examples of a hazard analysis worksheet, um, but it's still got the same nuts and bolts. So the hazard analysis worksheet that I'll show you guys uh, a little bit later, um, there's one that I have from Southern Nevada Health District. Write that down. Southern Nevada Health District, they have an amazing uh, sample HASA plan uh, on their site. Now the way that um, the HASA portal that we're going to use as the basis for our plan, um, the way that it does a hazard analysis worksheet, I don't particularly like because it asks you to put your, um, your hazards in each CCP. They say Hey, give me all of your potential hazards, and if they overlap, that's fine. I like that one. Uh, that one's a little bit easier, but we still have it a hazard analysis in each place, and for each one, I'm still, I'm still writing out what my critical control points are uh, and my, what my potential physical, biological, um, and chemical hazards are. So, lots of colors, ingredients are the same. Okay. Southern Nevada Health District. And I tried to pull some examples for you guys of some of their, um, their cooking logs and stuff like that. 404, a page cannot be found. Sorry. Really? Because when you ask me for it, I'm going to say page cannot be found. Uh, so, yeah. So the HACCP plan, what does it contain? Like, what's the big, scary, 40-page beast that you got to have in your kitchen? Uh, it's not that bad. Uh, I studied this for, studied this stuff backwards and forwards about, for about a month, and within, like, a couple days, I had it down pat, and then it was just reaffirming what I was learning and stuff like that. It can be learned. This stuff is not as scary as it seems. And I'm start, I'll be starting to sound like a broken record. You'll see. Assessment information. So this is list of foods and ingredients involved in the process. Uh, what's in your chicken? Uh, I got garlic, I got thyme, I got oil, I got salt, um, I got a little bit of white wine. Uh, defining the process. This is a sous vide process. This isn't cook chill ROP. This isn't just ROP. So let's say uh, cook chill. I make my chili, uh, I use a tilt skillet, I've got beans, meat, uh, salt, paprika. I mean, you got to go down to every little detail. Uh, but then I chill it and then I vacuum package it. That's cook chill. And then ROP is I get this into the door and I vacuum package my coffee beans because they stay fresh. That's ROP. And then sous vide is I'm going to apply heat to this thing while it's in the bag. Uh, defining equipment. The best thing that you can do for yourself if you have a HACCP plan in place is get yourself a stainless steel table, put your sous vide baths there and your vacuum machine there and don't move them. Uh, the reason for that is because you have to define what equipment is in play for each, for each product. So for my chicken breast, for my sandwich, I have a stainless table, I have a uh, Poly Science Chef Series, I have a polycarbonate tank, I have a lid, I have got a cutting board, I've got a chef knife. All of this, you have to list this and it sucks, but you have to do it once. So there's the saving grace. Um, but the stuff that's on this table, it never changes. So this can kind of become just like, you can swap it out for product, for, for different uh, ingredients and stuff like that. For, I do the chicken here, I do the steak here, I do the whatever here. The equipment is roughly the same. So put it in one place and don't move it. Um, in your facility information, <clears throat> Poly Science is located at 19400 Southwestern Avenue, Torrance, California, 90501. Uh, facility information, who manages it? Dave Petransic is the manager of the HACCP plan at this location. Um, when he's not on duty, it's this person. He can be reached at this number, just, just in case. This is also his email. All of your facility information. Uh, where's your product going to be sold? 
I run a restaurant. It's going to be sold at the restaurant, at this address. Because um, a lot of concern, when we looked back historically at, at ROP packaging, it was, I'm going to package this and sell it to somebody so they can put it on a shelf for three weeks and then put a sell bite or put a you know, discount on it uh, when it's ready to die. So applying this to a restaurant, they weren't so happy about that. Um, but for most cases, you say, it's going to be sold at the restaurant. It's going to be sold on site. Um, hazard analysis worksheet. I talked about this earlier. What potential hazards exist? Biological, chemical, and physical. Uh, and the Southern Nevada Health District has an awesome plug and play. Like you click this link and it gives you a whole list. And it says this bacteria, this bacteria, this bacteria. And then it says commonly found in these foods. If that food is in your ingredients list, put that on your biological, on your biological list. It couldn't be easier. If this matches this, put it here. Um, so I really like the Southern Nevada Health District um, hazard analysis worksheet. Process flow, again, these are the steps as food moves through my establishment. Uh, then we've got our HACCP worksheet. So from our process flow, we're gonna identify our seven principles of HACCP. We've got my hazard analysis, my critical control points, critical limits, monitoring, verification, my record keeping. And this goes into a big grid looking thing. You all seen it and you're like, what the heck am I looking at? That's what you're looking at. You've got your process flow along one side and that's where your CCPs are gonna be. And then you've got your critical limits. What am I doing to control them? Then how am I monitoring those? How am I verifying that monitoring? And then <clears throat> record keeping. In the record keeping column, you usually put records will be held on site for one year. That one's in the lot. And then SOP documentation. So I said earlier, some hazards are not controlled at CCPs by uh, critical limits. They're handled by SOPs. So norovirus is managed by employee hygiene and hand washing. SOPs are created for hygiene and hand washing. Other examples uh, include, this is how we receive product. This is how we calibrate a thermometer. This is how I'm going to train my employees. When they come in, uh, they're gonna receive this, this, and this document. They're gonna be initialed in this by, the, by them and myself. Um, we're gonna keep all of our employee training logs in this. They'll also be handed uh, a HACCP vocabulary sheet. Um, this person, he's gonna manage, he's running the fish station. So he'll be the only one vacuum packaging. He gets a how to vacuum product, um, standardized operating procedure. You get the idea. And then logs, log everything. They want to see logs. Log everything that you can. Uh, especially if it's got temperature, log it. Uh, and there's now, now it's a lot easier because for the longest time it was, okay, it's this, this o'clock. Hold on, fish delivery. Okay, what what's the temperature of this? What's the temperature of the low boy? What's the temperature of this? Now there's so much plug-and-play digital solutions in place, just buy one. Uh, they stick a thing in your, in your walk-in, it stick a thing in your low boy, and it just logs it all day long, prints it out for you at the end of the day. If you've got to have HACCP in place, do yourself a favor and buy one. Um, you can get automated logging for all your refrigeration and stuff. Um, they even have some systems where you can receive your, you have your receiving products. You can create your own logs within it and stuff like that and it'll all keep them digitally. So there's, there's new solutions. So the logging isn't really so much of a hassle anymore. Um, and some places I might ask you for a waiver. I, for a special process, smoking, curing, uh, sous vide cooking, just ROP in general, they may fill, ask you to fill out a waiver um, and you have to hand that in too. So you hand them all these things and hopefully they give you a green light. So, next slide. Let's build a HACCP plan. 